So we've been talking about how things move and in particular we've been looking at how things move passively by diffusion over the last few lectures. So, today what we will look at is sort of starting to describe the environment in which these things move and how do we describe the laws of physics in in these environments. So, we will describe the fluids, we will develop the equations for the fluid flows uh, in biological contexts. Uh, so, water is basically everywhere right cells are swimming in water organisms are swimming in water inside of cells is also mostly water with proteins and so on and so forth mixed in. And therefore, it is uh, so all of this diffusion transport transcription translation all of this is happening in this fluid background. So, it is good to understand it is important to understand how to describe these fluids in the biological context. When I say it is water, does a biological uh, protein or a, bio or a cell E. coli or paramecium or whatever which is swimming in water does is its experience or would its description of water be the same as how we experience water ok. So, that is sort of the thing that we will try to describe. What are the properties we can use to describe fluids and what they mean at these biological length scales and these biological time scales ok. So, we have been looking at diffusion and as we saw so, diffusion is a major driver of transport of molecules in this nano or this micron sized world of biology. It is a dissipative process in that it tends to raise ordered arrangements of molecules. So, if you started off with a delta function like we saw eventually you will go to a flat peak through a Gaussian and so on ok. So, it tends to erase any order that you might have eventually it tends to erase any order that you might have in the system. Similarly, a uh, viscous friction that dominates mechanics in the nano world ok. Uh, this is also dissipative uh, it tends to again erase ordered motion and it converts it into random energy or thermal energy ok. So, this viscosity or this viscous friction is what we will try to talk about today how to characterize it and quantify it and so on. Underlying this is this sort of idea that uh, how does how do fluid flows how do these uh, fluid environments or these fluid backgrounds uh, differ depending on these biological scales. So, for example, if I have a bacteria which swims in water versus a fish which swims in water, it will turn out that the strategies that it uses in order to propel itself will be very different for this bacteria as opposed to this fish ok. And that is because if you write down the equations of motion for this fluid, you will see that the terms which are important will be very different whether depending on whether it is a bacteria or depending on whether it is a fu fluid. So, if the terms in these equations are very different the terms which play an important role are different although the underlying background equation is the same the relative importance of the different terms varies and it will turn out that because of these differences these organisms which are at very different length scales this is at the micron scale this is at centimeters or whatever meters if you have big fish or humans or whatever the strategies that they have evolved in order to transport themselves in this fluid background they also turn out to be very different ok. So, eventually over the next 2 3 lectures we will sort of try to see what sort of strategies these biological organisms which live in this micron scale microns tens of microns whatever at scales such as these what sort of strategies they have evolved in order to propel themselves in this fluid background. And again at the back of all of this is a lot of experiments for example, you can track how fluid flows behave around this. So, this is um, uh, if I am not this is plasmodium uh, over here on the left and that is some fish I forget what fish some sun fish I think it is called. And you can map out the fluid flows around this organism this or that as it moves through water ok. So, for example, here are the vector fields. So, fluid I would characterize it by a density and a velocity. So, as a fluid so, you have some fluid or whatever that is say flowing. So, as it is flowing it has some velocity field which might depend on space and on time. So, it can depend on space and it can depend on time and what these arrows show you are these velocities. Uh, so, this black dot over here ok. So, this black dot over here is this uh, algae 
and it is moving I think in this direction and this arrow show the velocity uh, the velocity vector field of the fluid as it moves through the fluid. Similarly, for the fish again you can do this. Uh, so, basically you place fluorescent beads and track their motion uh, fluorescent beads in this fluid and you track their motion and again you can construct velocity vector vector fields of the velocity as this fish swims through the water. So, this fish is I think swimming in this way. And what you will notice is that the scales are very different. Uh, so, for example, for this algae the scale is around 10 microns. Uh, so, this scale bar over here is 10 microns for this fish that scale bar is 1 centimeters. The velocities with which they move is also very different. This is roughly of the order of tens of microns. So, these are around 80 microns per second that is of the order of centimeters. So, that is around 10 centimeters per second. And we'll what we'll try to do is that we'll try to come up with properties of the fluids. So, for example, viscosity, and combine them with the properties of the object that are moving in this fluid. So, for example, the length scales or the velocities of this uh, bacteria or algae or whatever, and try to come up with a way to sort of quantify what sort of terms will be important when we're looking at the physics of this swimming. So, what we will basically first try to do is that we will first try to derive the equations that govern fluid flow and that equation as you may know is called the Navier-Stokes equation called the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay. So, firstly I will try to uh, derive that solving the Navier-Stokes equation is a very difficult task uh, in the most general case and I will explain why later on. But at least you can do some sort of numerical you can do numerical simulations. So, this is one particular case of a paramecium which is swimming in some viscous flow. Um, these are actual experiments where you can construct the velocity field of this paramecium as it moves. You can then solve these uh, solve this uh, hydrodynamic equations and you can compare with this. So, for example, let us forget the streamlines if you look at this velocity contour map these are the the top panel of the experiments the bottom panel are the simulations uh, based on this Navier Stokes equation and you can reproduce a lot of the effects that a lot of the observations that you see in these experiments. So, the a key sort of quantity that tells us what sort of terms will be important in this Navier Stokes equation is what is called this Reynolds number which is a measure of how strong the inertial forces are compared to how strong the viscous forces are. And I will deal with this a lot I will go into more detail about what I mean by this uh, after we have done the Navier Stokes equation. How many of you have done so some amount of hydrodynamics before? Okay. Continuum mechanics ok all right the rest of so, I will do a very loose derivation, but um, it should hopefully be instructive. The thing is that, um, so we have this Reynolds number, we have this Reynolds number, which tells us the relative magnitude of the inertial forces, inertial forces to the viscous forces. So, if inertia dominates then you have this if you were writing the Newton's laws of motion you would have that m d a d t term which would play a dominant role. So, the physics in the regime where inertial forces dominate is the physics of the macro world It's the physics of Newton's laws that we are sort of more familiar with ok. So, when Reynolds number is much much larger than 1 that corresponds to the macro world in some sense and still keeping this very loose I will make this a little more rigorous as we go along. On the other hand if viscous forces dominate then you get to what a what the environment that you see is what the environment that these biological microorganisms swim in. Uh, so, this is the biological world. I should not say maybe biological, I should say cellular or something. So, the scales of these microns, the Reynolds numbers uh, for these fluid flows will be turn out to be much smaller than 1, 
and the physics at these scales at these low Reynolds number will look very different from the normal physics that we are more generally used to ok. So, here for example, is this very famous experiment it is called the pitch drop experiment. This is uh, one of the world's longest running experiments it was started in 1927 and it still goes on ok. The person who started the experiment has died I think the second person has also died somebody else is carrying on the experiment. So, this is an experiment where you just let uh, you this person fill the jar with pitch and he allowed the pitch to drop and roughly one drop of pitch falls at the rate of uh, I think 10 to 12 years. So, every 10 to 12 years you have one drop of pitch falling from this upper conical thing to this lower beaker ok. So, in this 1927 to current uh, today 9 drops have fallen. People are waiting to see the 10th drop, which is why this website is called the 10th watch. It has a live stream where you can watch if you are completely bored out of your mind, you can go and watch nothing happen. I think the 10th drop is scheduled to fall sometime in 2022 or something, if all goes according to plan. So, these are extremely viscous objects. So, this is pitch, um, it's a, I forget what exact kind of pitch it is. Uh, but these are extremely viscous. Um, if you were going th to travel through pitch, you can imagine as opposed to air, for example, if you are trying to walk, walk through a thing, a medium which was as viscous as this, uh, you might guess that the strategies that you use to sort of walk around this room may not be very suitable to the strategies you would need to deploy if you were living in such an environment. And as it turns out, the biological environment is closer to this than to air. So, a microorganism which is swimming inside a cell or whatever in water or something feels its environment as something as if it is moving through this blob of pitch ok. Um, so, that is the sort of qualitative difference. Um, if you look at the viscosity of pitch I think from these experiments uh, I, I might be wrong. So, the viscosity of water the viscosity of water is around um 10 to the power of roughly around 10 to the power of minus 3 Pascal seconds and the viscosity of this pitch that they have measured from this pitch drop experiments is something of the if I remember correctly is something like um 10 to the power of 10 times that of water mm, so around 10 to the power of 7. So, these are extremely extremely viscous uh, it is of almost unimaginable for us to to think about or to contemplate about moving in uh, environment that looks like this, but that is precisely what cells do ok. To show another fun experiment and again many of you may have seen this before. So, here is an experiment where they have a beaker filled with some viscous substance I think this was corn syrup and they place a die. How many of you have seen this experiment? Good, most of you. Uh, so, you place a die in it and you rotate the inner cylinder with respect to the outer cylinder in a circular motion and uh, so, he places many dies uh, I think three colors and so on and as he rotates the he rotates these two cylinders with re respect to one another what you will see is an apparent mixing of these dies as you would normally expect. So, he rotates the cylinders with respect to one another and these three colors the red blue and the green they sort of mix to one another. At some point he will stop and he will start to rotate it in the reverse direction ok. So, this is the well mixed sort of limit where all the three colors have apparently mixed into one another. And now he stops and he sort of yes. Huh? Because they want to make sure that the forward motion and the reverse motion are as closely opposite to one another as possible. So, they do not want to the set up itself to sort of rotate, they do not want to disturb the setup itself. He is doing it very slowly in a controlled fashion. 
So, as you rotate it in this reverse direction, what you will see as opposed to this normal mixing that one might be familiar with uh, is that the colors of those blobs of dyes will come back to their original position, they sort of unmix from one another. So, this is not something that you would expect if you were to mix, if you were to take three, this is not something that you would expect if you were to take three random drops of dry in water and you do this no matter how you do this in a very nice way and you reverse it, you will never get this sort of a very clean unmixing. So, what is going on here from those of you who have seen the video is this violation of the second law of entropy. Yes, Krishna. Generally, I say that you know when things have mixed up together, I have increased the entropy, I have everything is sort of well mixed, and I would expect that the second law of thermodynamics tells me that you know once I have achieved this high entropy state, I should not be able to come back to this uh, well separated or unmixing sort of unmixed sort of state. So, what is the what is going on over here? The thing that goes on is that this is not really a true mixing in that sense, um, because this fluid is so viscous. What happens is that all this rotation does is that it stretches this blob. So, for example, you had this blob and you had another blob, and as you rotate it, you are sort of shearing this. So, it sort of stretches this blob and it stretches this blob. So, it is still a single blob even in this limit where it looks like it is completely mixed. Even here what you have basically done is that you have taken this blob and you have stretched it and stretched it, but it is still a single blob which is not really mixed with the other dyes ok. So, and this is possible because this is such a highly viscous liquid. Then when you unmix it you are slowly reversing back the shear that you have given and eventually you will come if you do it slowly enough and in a controlled enough fashion you should be able to come back to this original initial condition that you started off with ok. So, it is although it looks to be mixing this is a sort of uh, apparent mixing in that what is happening is what is called the lam laminar flow is called the laminar flow where you stretch out this blob without truly mixing the different colors. So, again this is something that is characteristic of this low Reynolds number flows, uh, it is very difficult to mix, uh, it is difficult to mix highly viscous liquids ok. It is easier to mix uh, liquids which have low viscosity for example ok. Um, another example this is again a very classic example done in the 1950s by this famous uh, person called G I Taylor from Cambridge. Uh, this is actually a small part of a movie that he has on this low Reynolds number flows, not movie a documentary let us say, it is an hour long documentary you can watch it if you are interested. So, here is again a dye which is being injected into a syrup ok, there is again a very highly viscous syrup. Because the viscosity is so high, the dye does not even penetrate too much. So, generally if I just put it, it would get mixed, but because this visco viscosity is so high and or rather what is the more uh, relevant quantity is this Reynolds number. The Reynolds number for this is very low, uh, this dye does not mix at all, it sort of gets into this blob and just sits there ok. So, this is I am sorry for the quality. Uh, so, this is this corn syrup, then he has a bunch of other beakers which has uh, glycerine which is slightly uh, which has a slightly higher Reynolds number. So, the Reynolds number is Reynolds number of syrup is smaller than the Reynolds number of glycerine which is the second beaker and then I think he has glycerine plus water, glycerine plus water and the fourth beaker has water. So, the this is the lowest Reynolds number this was this is the third one right yeah. So, this is glycerine plus water where it sort of penetrates the full depth, uh, but it does not really disperse and this has a Reynolds number of around 200 uh, again I will come to what this Reynolds number exact definition, but this is a higher Reynolds number than this glycerine. And finally, he will do it for water uh, which has a even higher Reynolds number and this is something that we would expect based on a, a normal macro world sort of an experience you throw in a jet it sort of it 
gets turbulent, it mixes almost immediately. So, depending on the viscosity of the fluid or more accurately depending on the Reynolds number of so, which depends on the velocity as well as the size of this of this jet you will get mixing to completely different aspects. So, if you were to simply look at the movie over here and this movie for corn syrup versus this movie for water, you would see that the physics that is going on is very different in these two cases right and that is what we will sort of try to quantify as we go along that what are the terms in this Navier-Stokes equation that will dominate the description of this corn syrup versus what are the terms that will dominate the description of this water huh? Why is the this one. Ah, uh, so this is because I am not really very sure, but it also as it sort of accumulates it also exerts some force back because of this vis viscous friction. So, it has not fallen a large enough amount and to exert some force back that force is not necessarily perpendicular to the surface. So, that plays. So, I, I would assume. So, this is a guess I would assume that sort of plays a role in the in the fact that that over there where it does not penetrate a lot it seems to go a bit wobbly over there. But at at the nozzle so basically he controls the experiment such that at the nozzle the velocity is exactly the same for all and the no for all the four cases and the nozzle is also of exactly the same uh, radius in all the four cases. So, the initial conditions for this dye are exactly the same all that differs is this liquid. All right. Um.